Good evening, everybody. This is Robin Nelson with another edition of Wrestle Popcast, and my guest tonight is Steve Cruz. How's it going, Steve? How's it going, brother? Doing good. Pretty good. Yeah. So, how is it over in the East Coast? Uh, pretty dead. Uh, same as pretty much everywhere. Not allowed to go anywhere. I got to wear a mask. Uh, it's still think winter here, so you know, it is what it is. We'll get through it. Oh, we definitely will. All right, um, let's talk about um, you. Um, tell us where you grew up at. So, uh, as a kid, grew up in the Adirondacks in a little hick town called Ticonderoga, uh, more known for Revolutionary War stuff and paper mills than anything else, really. Um, lived there uh, all through school and lived in Plattsburgh for Plattsburgh, New York, a couple hours north of there, like Canadian border of New York, Canadian Vermont border. Uh, lived up there for seven, eight years uh, until I went down to uh, World Heart Wrestling School in Schenectady around the capital area. And uh, from there, I've been all through New York and all over the place, but pretty much mostly New York. All right. So um, growing up in the New York area, uh, what got you to fall in love with pro wrestling and um, influenced you to become a pro wrestler, the training part of it? Uh, so, funny thing, I was, a, I was a little kid. I don't remember exactly how old I was, um, but I remember how it happened. I won at bingo, and I wanted toys that I could bring to the beach, so it was summertime. And I didn't know what they were at the time, but I bought two LJNs, uh, Corporal Kirshner and King Kong Bundy, and it wasn't too long after that, one Saturday morning, I saw uh, Kirshner wrestling, uh, whatever the Saturday morning wrestling was, All-American or something like that. And I started watching it, and I was hooked right off the bat. So um, I was always a fan, went to a bunch of the shows at Glens Falls Civic Center, Lake Placid Civic Center, um, Albany, New York. It, I, I, I call it the Pepsi or the Knickerbocker. It's uh, Times Union Center now. Um, went to shows, all the shows there growing up as a kid. My mom got me tickets. Um, and when I got up to Plattsburgh and I was doing security, I always said I was going to be a pro wrestler, but I was a little fat, uncoordinated kid. Now I'm an old, fat, uncoordinated guy. Not just, but uh, I was doing uh, mall security, and John LaHart with North Country Championship Wrestling was doing uh, autograph signings in the mall, and he would bring in guys like uh, Jake the Snake, Tatanka, Hacksaw, uh, brought in Axe from Demolition with Max Moon. And I got, my boss knew I was a wrestling fan, so we made that my post for the day was uh, crowd control, which didn't really need it, but he just put me there to hang out. And uh, I got talking with Axe, and he gave me info on uh, wrestling schools. And then John started having me go pick up the guys over at the airport in Burlington, Vermont, and bring them over um, for the autograph signings. And because I worked at the mall, I had access to the empty spaces. And one of the big anchor stores had gone out of business, and John and I got the idea of running a couple of shows. Um, so the second show that we ended up running there, um, I had already gone down and looked at Bonebreakers University in Baltimore, and I thought I was going to go there. And my job for that show, besides security, was to pick up Tom Brandy, who is Sal Sincere and the Patriot, uh, on the show. And he told me about the guys from World of Hurt, which is where we had rented the ring from that night. And some of the guys were up there. And he told me to go check them out, because they were going to teach me how to be hungry and teach me the old school way. Um, he wasn't knocking bone breakers. He was just saying, World of Hurt was where I wanted to be. And I went down and checked them out in Schenectady. Uh, a couple weeks later, and that was it. I moved to Schenectady, and I started going to World Hurt Wrestling Academy. That's pretty good. Um, tell me about your uh, wrestling dad, uh, Jeffrey Wilson, a.k.a. Sex Packet Brian. Sex Packet Brian Immaculate, Cranky Candy. Um, so I didn't know Jeff. Jeff didn't know me. Um, I paid Dave Dijon, who's Danger, and um, they paired me up with Jeff and he was going to be my teacher um, and he did my first probably four or six weeks um, I just got the crap beat out of me 
I went home with uh, bloody noses, bloody lips, welts from chops, headaches from getting tossed around all over the place, and kept going back, kept going back. We went four or five nights a week, and um, he put me through the ringer. And then after I kept going back, kept going back, uh, he finally started to teach me. So he taught me the old school way. He was trying to break me, um, and I didn't do it. And then uh, he he got me in the right mindset. He, you know, I'd have a bad match, and I'd, I'd call him. I'd be like, "Man, I suck. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not putting the boots on again. I'm gonna retire to hell with this." And he was like, "No, man, you're just gonna wake up one day, and you're gonna get it." And I'm like, "Nope, nope. I'm, I suck at this." And he he wouldn't let me quit. And there was one morning I remember I woke up after a show, and it was a horrible match the night before, and. I realized everything I did wrong. I'm like, wait a minute, I get it. And I called him. I'm like, dude, I got it. And he's like, see, I told you. Um, and he was right. Pretty much everything he's told me, everything that he taught me in the business uh, was true. Um, and he, he didn't get the credit that he deserved. He was, he he held every title of world hurt. I mean, so that was just that. He never asked for anything special. He was a workhorse. And, his dream was to wrestle Eddie Guerrero. He had a picture of Eddie Guerrero in his room and he looked at it every night and above it said, I have a date with Eddie Guerrero. And that was his dream match. It never got to come true, but um, he, was, he was a solid guy. And even today, like if I needed advice on stuff, even though I'm older than he is, he would uh, do whatever he could to help me out. He's, he's a solid dude that never got the credit or the opportunity that he should have. Wow, he seems like he should have. I mean, he, he like kicked your ass a lot too, and you worked with yeah. him a lot in the ring. Um, speaking of World of Hurt Wrestling, you're a mainstay in upstate New York. You worked at all kinds of promotions. Um, we'll go. We'll talk about a few of them. Um, tell me about uh, working over at uh, WNY. So, uh, so out in Buffalo. Yes, out in the Buffalo. Um, so yeah, in Western New York. Let's see. Worked mainly my first. My first real break, uh, if you want to call it that, um, Cranky couldn't do a show. Um, I always call him Cranky, even though he's Brian Immaculate, I still call him Cranky. Um, he couldn't do a show, and he was supposed to go out there and be in the frat pack with Marty the Party Dane. So Marty the Party called me, um, and he's like, hey, you want to go do a show in Buffalo? And I was about a year into the business at this point. Um, so Marty took me out to Buffalo. And in Buffalo, I went to Buffalo Championship Wrestling, BCW, um, which the guys that worked at BCW will also call it Broken Ring Championship Wrestling because we always managed to break the ring there. Um, and I met everybody out there. That was run by Troy the Boy Buchanan. And I remember first thing Troy asked me was, um, can you change your name? And I said, why? He said, because we already got a cruise on the show. It was a crazy cruise. Um, I, a guy that lives out in the Buffalo area and was working for him already. I'm like, well, I'm like, I, I could, I could do this other mask gimmick I got. I'm like, but I didn't bring the gear. He's like, we can just call you the name. I'm like, well, my name is written on my tights. He's like, all right, screw it. Just, just keep Steve Cruz and we'll, and we'll run with it. Um, and that was one of the things Cranky taught me early on. He's like, don't change for anybody. He's like, your gimmick is your gimmick. Your name is your name. Your character is your character. He's like, you can go heel face, but don't change. He's like, stay you. Um, and I started being, a, I ended up a regular at BCW, um, maybe a year after that, uh, won my first title in wrestling there, the Buffalo championship wrestling television title, which if you ask me or Hellcat, we'll both tell you that that title is cursed and it comes with back injuries. And both of us have had spinal fusion after holding that title. So it holds true. Um, the only person that held it much that didn't have the surgery is Troy the boy but uh, never say never it's not over he can still have surgery the first kid to live on you never know but I was in BCW for a long time uh, ended up having some great matches out there um, singles career wise um, with Brick Matrix Kevin Dunn Mean Marcos a um, bunch of bunch of people out there it was it was fun out there Met a bunch of the guys in Rochester and up in Ontario from working out there. 
Uh, and Troy's still one of my best friends. I'm in his wedding coming up this fall. Well, assuming that it still happens this fall with all the stuff going on. But BCW was awesome. It was a good time out there. BCW, a cursed championship belt. Since you and some other people have gotten injured of that, that's that's a scary thing. I never knew there was, like, cursed wrestling belts. Well, at this one, so Hellcat was the first TV champion, uh, and he had to surrender the title uh, when he was having his back surgeries, and I took over the vacant title after winning it. It wasn't really a tournament. It was me versus uh, Kevin Dunn um, for the title, and I, I got and that night I injured my back, and the next night I was working for um, RPW Rochester Pro Wrestling in uh, Rochester for Ian Decay, and I was supposed to be in a tournament and uh, go pretty deep in the tournament, but I blew my back out uh, winning the title. <laughs> So I couldn't stand up straight. So I ended up being in a, uh, 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 I can't think of the name of that, like a frenzy, just like a, like six dudes just thrown into the match. Um, and they called it the fight for your spot. Um, and I ended up, I, I, I call it, I road dogged it all through the match. I was outside. I couldn't stand up straight. So as soon as I started to get up from selling, someone would knock me down again, uh, because I couldn't really do anything. Um, and I remember, the ring announcer for that one uh, when I went over and won the match. He's like, don't worry, guys, you'll make it someday. And as I'm walking by, I'm like, dude, I won a belt last night. Shut up. Um, but funny story of that is um, two of the guys in that match, uh, Alan Olsen at the time, everybody knows him as extremely cute wrestler. Colin Delaney was in that match. And this other guy, uh, you might have heard of him, uh, Brody Lee. Yeah, I've heard of Brody Lee. At the time, he was HB2, um, and then he became Brody Lee, and then he was Luke Harper, and now he's Brody Lee again. But he was also in that match, and I'll always remember it because he was. We did at the end. Everybody hit a finisher, and my job was to slide in after Brody hit his finisher, and knock him off the top rope and steal the pin. Uh, so I hit Brody with a forearm on the lower back when he was standing on the second turnbuckle. And dude just takes a dive out to a concrete floor. <laughs> I don't know why, um, but that's what he did. Uh, it was just weird, like, some of the talent that was in that match when you think back on it because we were all young and green and didn't know what the hell was going on. And here two of these guys ended up with WWE contracts and made a name for themselves. It was pretty neat to look back on. That's pretty wild, um, especially since you were in Buffalo. Um, you um, mentioned uh, you were over in Ontario as well, over uh, in Pro Wrestling Canada, where it's a hotbed. Um, while you were in Ontario, um, um, you worked uh, Vito uh, Scarphone yep. and Mike O'Shea. Yep, worked uh, Mike O'Shea ran, um, uh, I can't remember the name of his fed off the top of my head, which is bad because I was his, I always made a joke I was his heavyweight champion for like five years um, because he stopped running and then he started up again. But uh, I worked for Mike, both tag and singles. Um, and I always had a pretty good time up there. He got us, you know, some good matches. Uh, I worked A1 from TNA and then uh, uh, later on, I think that was one of the places where Dudley and I worked A1 and Divine. Um, not really as the killer Steve's. I was under a hood. Um, but it was pretty much the Steve's there. Um, so I got to run around with uh, Troy the Boy and, and Brody and Triple X on Falco up there and that Rex Atkins up there when he was green. Uh, got to have a lot of fun up there um, with Vito. Um, only a couple shows for Vito up there. And uh, the most memorable match we had there was, I had up there was uh, uh, the first time I ever worked sick, Rick Matrix, who trained out with Al Snow. Um, Matrix and I knew each other from our Rochester and Buffalo days, but we had never worked. And we were in the main event, and Vito wanted it to go a 30-minute Broadway, and it was an Iron Man. So I pitched my idea to Matrix, um, for the finish, 
and he liked it, and then he decided we weren't calling anything else for the match. We literally called the last 30 seconds of the match, and then we went out and we worked 30 minutes and actually had a really good match. Um, it was a lot of fun. Rick is a hard hitter. Um, worked a couple of times. Always know you've been in a match. Uh, can't call it fake when you're working Rick. I can't. Um, can you speak a little louder? I can barely hear you. Sorry, man. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. All right. Uh, working Rick, it was always like a rough match. You always knew you were in a match, so um, which was always fun. Um, but yeah, and then uh, there's a guy, Doug. I don't know Doug's last name. Um, he always wore a red shirt, so I called him Red Shirt Doug. Um, and he ran in Brantford and Simcoe. Uh, Studley and I worked for him for quite a while um, until he he stopped running at one point. Not really sure why. I think there were some health issues that he was having. Um, then we had a few spot shows up there uh, randomly. Rex Atkins ran a few shows. We worked for him. Um, but yeah, Canada was always fun. Had a lot of friends up there. Uh, never really saw the deal with Tim Hortons, which will probably get me heat with the Canadian guys. But uh it was, it was always a good time up there having fun. Now, what you were mentioning earlier, that was an interesting tag team you're with. Um, how'd you come up with uh, the Killer Steves, and how was that born? So, Studley and I ended up on a show together, and Studley was already on the show normally um, in Syracuse. So, it was uh, uh, UWA Ringmasters, and it was run by uh, Zachary Springgate the Third and Strangler Steve King. And Studley and I were on this show, and we were working. My first time there, we were going to work Jimmy Jam Olsen and Colin Olsen. And they picked, they knew me, so they picked me, and they threw, uh, the booker threw me with Studley because we were both named Steve. We were both wearing yellow and black that night, and we both said we were from Florida. That was totally the reason why we got paired up the first time. Uh, fast forward a couple shows later. Uh, they were going to do a tag team tournament. They said we were going to stick together as a team to come up with a team name. And this place had an average fan base of, like, 12. So I was kind of being a smart ass. And there was posters of legends around the locker room. So I'm like, hey, we'll be uh, we'll be the Heart Foundation. And he's like, come on, be a little serious. I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll paint our face. We'll be demolition. And he's like, come on, seriously. And I'm like, uh... We're wearing yellow and black. We'll be the killer bees. And Studley goes, we're the killer Steves. And the booker goes, fine. And he walked away. And that's how we got the name the killer Steves. <laughs> and it, they announced this is that that night. And it stuck. And we just ran with it. Um, and that was 2004. And we've been teaming up ever since. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That would have been funny if you guys were both wearing yellow and black masks like the killer bees. Oh, no, we I tried that in a different tag team uh, back in World of Hurt. Uh, this guy Thorne and I were thrown together, and we were called American Aggression was our first idea for a tag team. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we had the same build, um, and we tried the – we both bought Patriot masks, and we wore uh, BDU pants, like camo pants, like Corporal Kirshner style. Yeah. And halfway through the match, he was selling – and we went for our spot, and I rolled him out, and we both slipped the hoods on, and I rolled back in, and we thought we were going to get a big pop for it because we were baby faces. We just heard fans go, what are they doing? And we're just like, all right, we're never going to do that again. And that was the one and only time we were American aggression. <laughs> we, just, we gave up on that whole gimmick after that um, and went in a different direction. But So we, we I tried something like that. It, it failed. <laughs> That's pretty wild. I would have loved to saw that. <laughs> It was, we thought it was going to be awesome, and it, it bombed so bad. <laughs> I bet. And I bet you if Corporal Kirshner was standing right there, too, he'd probably be face palming. Oh, he'd probably hit us with the flag. <laughs> I hope he would hit us with the flag. So I'm glad you brought up Corporal Kirshner. I remember watching him as a kid in WWF as well. Um, he was a talented wrestler, and then after that, you hardly ever he heard of him. Yeah, like after his run with WWF, he kind of just, like, disappeared. Um, I tried looking him up. I've heard that he had done shows um, not too, too long ago. Um, but I, I heard, I mean, I read stuff. You can't believe anything you read on the Internet anymore for the most part. But, like, he, I guess he went 
like a little crazy, but I don't know. He was always just because of the way I got into wrestling. He was always one of my favorites just because he's one of the guys that started the passion for it. So Carper Kirchner was actually the one kind of influenced you a little bit to get into the ring. Yeah, there there were, there were some of the first ones. I mean, growing up, I ended up liking you know Ultimate Warrior, and you know I was a Warrior fan. I wasn't a Hogan guy. Um, you know, Warrior and the Rockers, Legion of Doom. Um, you know, it wasn't until I was you know I I always like you know Mister Perfect and stuff like that. It wasn't until I got to be an older fan that I got into the Rick Martel, Rick Rude, gorgeous Jimmy Garvin, uh, characters along those lines uh, where I kind of developed my singles character um, from all of them. That's pretty wild. Um, too bad you can't find Corporal Kirshner. I'm going to try to find him myself. He'd be kind of interested, interesting to uh, interview, I bet. I, I would love to pick his brain. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting to talk, see what, see what his take is on what it was then and what it is now. Yes, and you also have another name too. Uh, you also go by the American Outcast. How did you come up with that? Uh, after my back surgeries, when I got talked into coming back into the ring, um, I was no longer a lean, trim, pretty boy uh, character that I always used to play. I had put on about seventy pounds. Um, I got two full sleeve tattoos both, uh, my whole upper body is tattooed now uh, except my gut um, and I just I didn't feel that I could pull and at the time I had a beard that was like down to my waist I just didn't feel that I could pull off the Mr. One Night Stand persona anymore uh, coming out to Sharp Dress Man it just wasn't it, it wasn't going to work in my head and if I couldn't make it work in my head I wasn't going to be able to make it work in the fans heads um so I kind of came up with the my first idea, and I got some friends that can attest to this because they still bust my balls about it. I came up with the All American Nightmare, and I had designs written up. I knew a song I was going to do. I kind of had the character built in my head. Um, I had my gear lady working on gear. I had a T-shirt designed, and right before I was about to do a show and use that moniker. Cody Rhodes came out as American Nightmare, and I'm like, well, he trumps me, so I'm going to come up with something else. Uh, but I already had a lot of the designs done, so I tried to figure out something that I could still use the artwork um, and just change it a little bit, so I came up with American Outcast. Because um, I always, in a lot of the locker rooms I was in, I always kind of felt like I was a little bit of an outcast. Like, I didn't get into the, um, to the politics that's in some wrestling, and I, I tried to stay clear of all the drama and stuff like that. So I was, I, I was always one of the boys and I was respected. Um, but I was never, I, I never got into the, to the dark side of wrestling. So I always kind of felt like an outcast a little bit. Um, so I figured that kind of worked for me and my history. Yes. And you also worked with uh, Tommy dreamer too. Uh, I've done shows with Tommy. Um, I haven't got to be in the ring with him. Uh, but did a bunch of shows in New York with him. He did some two CW shows um, and did a couple shows with him most recently at uh, uh, Immortal Championship Wrestling for Mike King. I, um, did, so did you uh, get a chance to uh, pick his brain and uh, get some advice from him? Uh, at the most recent interaction I had with him at uh, Immortal, um, we watched a couple of the matches up in the bleachers and we were just kind of bouncing the psychology of it off of each other. It was more me bouncing it off of him. I, you know, he's not going to ask my advice on something that'd be kind of weird. Um, but, and it, it was refreshing to see that, you know, what he thought was weird. I also thought was weird. And we both kind of had ideas on how it could play it out better. I mean, the match was good. Um, just like little things that, Fans might not necessarily notice, yeah. Uh, but when you spend around twenty years or as long as he has, you notice little things that you'd be like, eh, "I'd have done something a little different." But it was, it was cool to to meet up with somebody that's a, that was still old school. Um, there's not a lot of old school left in wrestling today, so I, I still gravitate to the old school guys. Um, right before this insanity and coronavirus hit the U.S. Um, you had a match that was uh, postponed 
uh, for the Survival Championship Wrestling Championship against uh, Anthony Gaines. Yeah, we were going to be, so we were in the number one contender match. Um, and it was going to be uh, uh, none of a kind Anthony Gaines, who uh, really got his claim to fame when, I, I, I don't know the name of the guy that hit him. Uh, I'm not super current. Um, some stuff, but he took a shoulder tackle from a dude and launched him like eight rows into the crowd. And the video went viral. Um, and Anthony's career like took off. He started going everywhere. I mean, he was always good. I knew of him and I had seen him work and he was good. Um, but he really picked up after that. Um, and we were both really looking forward to the match. Um, and we loved that just as soon as it got announced, um, even though we had never really wrestled each other and I don't think either of us had worked for survival. Um, there was already banter from the fans going on just from the match announcement. So we were kind of pumped about that match and we're hoping that it still does happen uh, when all the craziness stops. Yeah, I'm looking, I would love to see that online after you guys have that match. Um, let's talk about another person we both know as well. Let's talk about David Stockwell. Never heard of the guy. <laughs> uh, so Dave and I go way way back he started training a little before me and then when I was in wrestling school he ended up being my boss at GNC um, and he tried to help me tweak my diet and he got me on some good supplements and then I was going in there so much when I was doing mall security down in Albany to pay the bills um, he hired me uh, so I could get a discount on some of the stuff um, and it was cool to have him and his wrestling mind uh, to bounce ideas off of um, while I was learning. Because um, Dave's wicked smart when it comes to the wrestling business. Like, he understands it. He hasn't necessarily been in the business as long as some people, but he, he's got a wrestling mind for it. Um, so it was, it was good to have somebody that, to bounce it off of as a peer and you know, come up with ideas and brainstorm and stuff like that. He's a good dude. Yeah, he is. Um, I got a, a chance to get to know him, too. We're pretty good friends like how you guys are um, when he came to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And he got uh, uh, got back into wrestling and started training under uh, Cody Hawk to, uh, you know, uh, brush up on the skills. And he got really good. And then he became a manager, and he's well-known in the Indies. And he goes by David Barnabas Specter of Darkness Worldwide, which is well well known in the Indies. So, um, has he ever reached out to you for you to become dark, part of Darkness Worldwide? I am a full fledged member of Darkness Worldwide. I'm his New York chapter, um, and we had it set up where if I can get past Anthony Gaines. Uh, and earn my spot, as I rightly should be, the number one contender for the Survival Championship Wrestling title. Um, I am pitching to get Mr. Spectre and more of Darkness Worldwide out into the New York area uh, so we can bring the darkness out to the East Coast. Oh, yeah, the East Coast would love David Barnum's Miss Spectre because every time he comes out, he gets a huge pop by the audience. And I want to tell you something. You've probably seen it. That kid can do an awesome promo on the mic. Yeah, he's, he's definitely good on the mic, which is something I can make a lot of use out of. Um, I was never a big promo guy. Uh, so having someone that can fill in the gaps there, it, it'd be awesome to work with Dave because it'd be 20 years in the making uh, to be able to do that. So it would definitely be a uh, bucket list for both of us. Yeah, and it'd be great. And if that ever happens to the East Coast, I may have to travel with David Barnabas Specter to, you know, come out and uh, see the the growth of Darkness Worldwide over in the East Coast of wrestling. Well, I know the area. I, I, if I remember right from an interaction you and I had last year, you're a Hooters fan, so I know where the Hooters is in the Albany area. <laughs> That's right. Um, I only go there for the beer and the wings. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you got to go for the beer and wings at Hooters, man. That's all I go for. I don't go for nothing else. <laughs> oh, 
you were, you were all business when you were there. Oh, you know I was. <laughs> um, let's talk um, when we first finally met, um, you know, uh, through David when you came to Cincinnati. Um, you're also big into the paranormal, and we all uh, took a tour of the haunted Bobby Mackey's over there in Kentucky which was, you know, shown on TV and a lot of famous paranormal investigators investigated that. So uh, tell me a little bit about some of the experiences you had over at Bobby Mackey's while we were there. That was my second time doing Bobby Mackey's on a Halloween night. Um, the first one I did was a couple years prior, and that was a five-hour overnight investigation, again, with Gatekeeper Paranormal. Um, we got a little bit of... Uh, intelligent voice answers that night and we heard some sounds that we couldn't explain um then the night that you and i were there um with some of the darkness worldwide members um we uh we definitely heard uh footsteps and stuff being dragged um to the left of the stage if you're facing the stage um everybody heard that uh, we had one member in our group who ended up getting scratched. She found it the next morning. Uh, she had about a two-inch long single claw mark down her abdomen. Um, uh, there was one group that got a voice answer for a name for one of the spirits that was there, and I believe it was Sarah. And um, when we were in the basement, uh, which is usually where a lot of the activity is going on, uh, two of our group was down outside of the well room and they said that a black mass came shuffling up on them and chased them down the hallway. And you could definitely hear two big bad wrestlers scream like little kids and go running down the hallway. Um, so it was definitely an active night. Even the investigator from Gatekeeper Paranormal said it was one of the more active nights that she had seen. And that was just in two hours. So I'd have loved to see if we had a couple extra hours down there to explore the basement, what we could have found that night, because it was definitely active that night. Oh, yeah, it was very active. Um, I picked up a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, paranormal as well. Um, I had a someone like breathe on the back of my neck. Uh, you kind of gave my skin to crawl a little bit. And remember when we were in the basement and we went to that one room where they had all the, the toys sitting there and yeah. then... And then uh, we made David sit there, and for some reason, um, you know, uh, the detector went off every time David was sitting over there for some reason. Yep. Oh, that was a trip. And then remember when David goes, I got a great idea. He goes, for uh, Darkness Worldwide, I'm going to do a promo in the haunted basement. So so while we're getting all this, like, paranormal activity, he's over there uh, <laughs> doing a promo all for... Business. Yeah, a promo for Darkness Worldwide, which was, you know, it, hey, that that was really great, and and that was just a classic. Yeah, that many, I, I can't think of any other wrestling group that has been in a legitimately haunted, uh, known haunted and demonically possessed building like that that just was able to do a promo and document it. Oh, it was I great. First. And while he was doing that promo, um, you know, <laughs> the EVP and their EVP and all the uh, and the ghost box was going off. It was going haywire too. Why David was doing that promo? <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, it was it, it was a it was, it was an interesting night. Uh, we even when we were up in the demon room or the exorcism room, um, one of the girls felt like she got punched in the hip, uh -huh. and when I went to check to see if she had any marks, um, one of the the EMF meter uh, went crazy. And about the same time I was checking her her hip, um, I felt a burn on my back. And the EMF meter went off when one of the guys was checking my back to see if I got scratched, but there wasn't anything there. It was just a hot mark uh, or a hot spot. Um, there, there was definitely stuff with us there that night. Um, most active I've seen, and I can't wait to go back. Next time I'm out in Cincinnati, we all got to go back. We definitely will. It was great to go with a bunch of uh, professional wrestlers investigating a haunted place like Bobby Mackey's. Yeah, definitely something you don't see every day. That should be our own re reality show. 
Oh, uh, have a you'll be like have a uh, professional wrestlers uh, paranormal investigation group and, you know, uh, do videos and post it online of all of our adventures to all these different haunted places. <laughs> I think we just came up with a show idea. Hey, I love it. Hey, you know, who knows? It could maybe be a reality. And speaking of the paranormal, um, what was your fascination that really got you into the paranormal, uh, as well as being a pro wrestler? Um, I think my first thing that ever got me really interested in paranormal was uh, uh, when I grew up in Ticonderoga, a buddy of mine from school, his parents were the caretakers of Fort Ticonderoga. Mm -hmm. So where they lived, uh, they had an apartment inside the fort. Um, And it was a little stairway that was marked private. And I always, when I was growing up, we went there on field trips every year as a kid. Um, And I always just thought it was like the office. Um, But come to find out, that's where he lived and he grew up. And inside, it was all rustic, and, like, he had a trap door in his bedroom that led to, like, a little hiding space for if there was ever an invasion and all that kind of stuff. And they let Dobermans out at night to roam the park, to roam the fort uh, after it was locked up. And he told me, he was the one that told me, he was like, yeah, he's like, you'll see stuff and hear stuff um, in the fort tonight. And I'm like, what do you mean? And we went walking around. And when we got over to the dungeon area, um which unfortunately has now been renovated, so it's not accurate to what it was back in the day. It's now a kitchen. Um, when ghost hunters went there, they found evidence in the kitchen of paranormal activity, but the kitchen actually used to be the dungeon, and the dogs would always bark around the dungeon, and you would hear chains and moans and disembodied yells coming from the dungeon area. And the only thing in the dungeon was mannequins and fixed chains. Like, the chains couldn't shake. There was nothing to move them. And they had hung there for years. And the mannequins are they're dummies. They don't do anything. So you could hear stuff going on there. And as we walked through one of the museum areas, there was an old rocking chair. I don't remember whose it was or what the legend was behind it. But it was rocking on its own. Nothing there. Nothing around it. As before the days of real surveillance cameras. I mean, we're talking like early 90s. Um, and the chair's just rocking. I'm like, that's moving. He's like, yeah, it does it all the time. Um, so that was really the first stuff that we, that I experienced. Um, and I always had kind of a thing for it after that. I always believed in ghosts. Um, and I think I experienced stuff around. Um, but I've yet to... I, I'm I'm yearning for the. I want to get, I want to get scratched. That's like my goal. I want to provoke enough where I get scratched, because that's something that my mind can't trick me on. I can't trick myself into scratching myself. So that would be like my validation that everything I've read up on and tried to find that would be like validation for it. Who knows? Maybe um, once uh, everything gets back to normal and you get back into pro wrestling, who knows? Maybe you'll be wrestling at some uh, haunted arenas. That would be awesome. I would totally go for that. And so what does Steve Cruz enjoy outside of the ring when he's, um, you know, beating up on his opponents? Uh, Enjoy-wise, uh I'm kind of a craft beer snob. I'm into hazy uh, New England IPAs. The hazier, the better. Uh, I like to grill. I'm a definite meat eater. Uh, I know some people don't agree with that, but if it didn't used to move, pluck, swim, fly, something, I don't want to eat it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a metalhead. Uh, I'll go to a metal show anywhere. Uh, Metallica is my favorite band. Dave and I saw Metallica together. Um, so any metal show I can get to, um, unfortunately, Slayer's done, so I uh, can't see them anymore. Um, you know, I work out. Uh, I catch shoplifters as a day job, you know, so uh, if I'm not fighting somebody in the ring, I'm fighting somebody for stealing stuff that doesn't belong to them. Um, I, I, I'm just outside of the ring. I'm just a, I'm a normal dude that looks like a biker. The only problem is I have never sat on a motorcycle and have no idea how to start one. <laughs> That's awesome. So when this insanity is over, um, where does uh, Steve Cruz go from here? Um, hopefully uh, with 
uh, Survival Championship Wrestling. I'll be able to rekindle a little bit of a singles career. Um, Studley and I have turned down a few bookings just because the dates hadn't worked out uh, before everybody, you know, was a sick person in the world. Um, so hopefully the Killer Steves will have a few extra bookings around uh, Immortal Championship Wrestling. Uh, has expressed some interest in bringing us back in. Um, I think Troy the Boy's getting the itch, even though he's not saying he's getting the itch. Um, you know, we'll, uh, never say never. I mean, I retired once and I came out of retirement, so I learned the hard way that nobody really retires in wrestling. Um, I know I'm old now. Um, I'm going to be 43. But uh, I still got some in the tank, and I can help uh, teach some of the new guys that are coming up the old school ways. Uh, so that's that's what my job is now. Maybe we'll see you uh, start uh, wrestling coming towards the Midwest, where I'm at. I'd be down. I've only wrestled one time in Ohio. I wrestled for uh, JT Lightning way back in the day um, up in Cleveland area. Um, and I actually wrestled Troy the Boy that night. Um, so I'd be down for when I'm out that way to pick up a couple bookings and see what it's like out there. What was it like working for JT Lightning? Um, I've heard a lot of great things about him. Um, I, I don't remember. I remember meeting him. Uh, he was he was cool. He'd never met me. Uh, he booked me on the recommendation of Troy. Troy knew him. Um, pretty laid back show. Uh, seemed well run. Uh, he seemed very respected in the locker room. Um, I know his his daughter better than I know him. I know Hannah uh, from, you know, being in the Rochester area. Um, you know, and she's following in her dad's footsteps, which I can only imagine makes him happy as hell. Um, but I've never heard anybody have a bad word to say about JT. All right. So where can everybody find uh, Steve Cruz on social media if they want to know what you're doing next and uh, when you have some upcoming matches and being part of Darkness Worldwide once everything's all destroyed this coronavirus? Right. Uh, so on Twitter, I am at Steve Cruz, S-T-E-V-E-O-K-R-U-Z. Um, also on Facebook at Steve Cruz, S-T-E-V-E-O-K-R-U-Z. Uh, you can Google search matches and stuff like that. Stubby and I got a bunch of stuff on YouTube, and I got some single stuff on there. Uh, just be careful to not spell Cruz C-R-U-Z, uh, because you will get a gay porn star. <laughs> I did that completely intentionally when I came up with that name. Um, and then uh, on Instagram, I am Ink Bald Guy. No spaces, just Ink Bald Guy. I n k e d b a l d g u i. Um, and we're also, Studley and I are on ProWrestlingTees.com, uh, and the store is Killer Steve Cruz. Um, you can search Killer Steve's or Steve Cruz or just Cruz, spelled the right way, um, and you'll get to our store. And we got a few Steve shirts up, and I got a few single shirts up there as of right now. All right. Thank you for uh, coming out of your busy time to come onto the show tonight. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, it was a pleasure. And everybody else, uh, thank you for listening to Wrestle Popcast. And you can follow Wrestle Popcast at Twitter at Rob Kicks. Um, you can also subscribe to Wrestle Popcast on YouTube. And you can follow me at Robin Paul Nelson on Facebook. And you can uh, like and subscribe of my podcast platforms at Wrestle Popcast on Spreaker.com, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts. Podcast City Network at podcastcity.net, hitting the Marks Podcast Network. Everybody have a great evening.